All right, 1.5, inverse relations. What we're looking at here is something we've done in grade 11 that we're going to re-explore in grade 12. The inverse relation of f at x is denoted by a symbol that looks like this. So you see an f with a minus 1. This is not an exponent, folks. It means f inverse of x. So it's a function, and we want to find the inverse. Uh, this denotes the inverse function. Function notation can only be used when the inverse is a function. The graph of the inverse function is a reflection in the line y equals x. Now, not all inverses are functions. For example, the domain and a range of the original function may need to be restricted. Why is that the case? Well, think about parabolas. If I take a parabola, let's just sketch one right here. I take a parabola and let's say it's opening up in this such a way. When I do the inverse of that parabola, we take this parabola and go sideways. You see how that side, that would be the inverse of, of a particular parabola. Sideways parabola means it's not a function. So what you have to do is literally take that first function right there, that one that's right here, and split it. Restrict the domain so that we're only looking at, for example, just half of the parabola. Let's say this half that's in black right here. Okay, this half, we're only restricting the domain. So that means I'm only going to take one part of one side of the, from the vertex. Not both sides, but one side. Now, when I take the inverse of that one side, so just the black graph, that will result in this part of the graph right here. That, in itself, is a function because it's only the black part and not the whole function. Anyways, so the idea is you restrict the domain. Now, the domain, remember, of a function is the range of its inverse. And the range of a function is the domain of its inverse. This definition is, is important a little bit later on. All right, now, for graphs, the inverse is determined by interchanging the independent and dependent values. For example, if you have 2, negative 3 as a point on the function, what will be the inverse point? So again, by understanding the question, it says interchange the independent and dependent values. Well, we take 2, negative 3 and swap them to get negative 3, 2. And this is a point on the inverse function. Okay. Now, to find the inverse algebraically, we replace f at x with y and interchange the x and y. So we switch the x and y variables. Then, what you will do is solve for y. So we're going to see example of this as well in the examples. All right, on to the next question. Example 1. Determine the inverse of f at x equals 2x squared minus 4x plus 3. What is this asking? Well, the original function is a parabola. Now some of you are going, okay, I'm going to go switch the x and the y. You can't do that, folks. The reason why is we're going to need to solve for y. The original question has an x squared and an x. So the way the function is, the current form of this particular function, is not in a form that we can isolate for x. So what can we do here? Well, if you recall from grade 10 and grade 11, if you have a parabola in standard form, which is expanded form, which is what you have right here, this is expanded form, what we can do with the expanded form is complete the square. When we complete the square, what that gives us is graphable form. Graphable form also gives us where there is just the variable x. So let's put that equation in vertex form by completing the square. So, by letting y equal f at x, we replace it and complete the square. Now let's talk about how to complete the square. Back in grade 10, what we did, and grade 11, what you had to do is x squared has a number attached to it. In order to complete the square, x should not have anything attached to it at all. So remove this 2 from all the x's. So that's what happened here. This is what we did. We removed the 2 from both, all the x's. 
we left the number on the outside. The idea here is by removing the two from here and here, the second pieces, we will have now something that we could com potentially complete the square. Now we have to make that perfect square inside the bracket. So we have x squared minus 2x, and we're going to take this 2, divide it by 2, and square it, which will give you 1. On the outside, you'll have pl plus 3, but then, wait a minute. We added something here, so we're going to have to take it away. We take away the 1, multiply by the number in the front, and then add 3. So we do that now to complete the square. You have x minus 1, all squared, plus 1. Let's do that again. Sorry, folks. We're going to just move this a little further. And we end up with, okay, 2x minus 1 squared plus 1. Where did that plus 1 come from? Let's move this a little faster. Uh, there we go. What is that? Well, this plus 1 came from negative 1 times 2 plus 3, which is just 1. So, instead of writing this line, folks, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you what I expect is the minimum when you complete the square. So, we're going to erase those two lines again and write this out a different way. So, you still have to remove the 2 from each of these pieces right here. So, that's what we did. Then, what you're going to do is the number next to the x, you divide it by 2, put that number there, then you close the bracket, and you bring the square out. So it's going to be x minus 1 all squared right away. If you were to expand this x minus 1 all squared, it would be x squared minus 2x plus 1. There's our x squared minus 2x. Now what we have to do is you always, always, always put a subtraction sign right there. What we're going to subtract is the number on the outside multiplied by the number on the inside squared. This is always going to be the case over here. Number on the outside multiplied by the number on the inside squared. Now remember, if there was a negative right here, just like there's a negative one here, there may be a negative one in here. If there's a negative one inside the bracket, when you square it, it will turn positive. But if there's a negative on the outside like it is there, and we put it here, that will change things. That will change this sign. So keep that in mind when you do questions with completing the square. We add the 3, and lo and behold, guess what, folks? We end up with the same equation. Well, what do we do now? Well, look at the word. It says switch. And that's what we're going to have to do now is switch. Switch the x and y so that you can solve for y. Now, I want you to look at this question. Why did I highlight this y? Is this truly y? Well, we switched the x and the y. Why do we do that? Because we need to find the inverse. So think of this y as the inverse. Now, you could write y to, with a minus 1 beside here, no problem, right up here. But I just highlighted or made a capital to remind you that we're looking for the inverse. Rather than having extra things that we might forget to write or make those things disappear or somehow they detach themselves. So there's a y there. You now are going to isolate for y. So you move the plus 1 over so that you have this plus 1 moves over to the other side to become minus 1. Next thing you do is divide by 2. Alright, just like that. We're going to divide by 2 to get rid of this 2. And then we have to take the square root, but be careful. We have to take the plus or minus version of the square root. And the reason why we have to do that is this number on the inside could have been a positive number or could have been a negative number because once we square it, it becomes positive automatically. So that's why we have to take the plus or minus here, and we get x minus, well, the plus or minus the square root of x minus 1 all over 2 is equal to y minus 1. And find the last step, move the minus 1 over, and this turns out to be our inverse. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering, where did all of a sudden this inverse come? 
from the one that's over here. Well, folks, keep in mind that this inverse was actually this y, which is actually the one that we switched, and we switched it to find that inverse, which is f, at, f inverse of x. So the final statement is, is f inverse of x is equal to 1 plus or minus the square root of x minus 1 over 2. You don't need to rationalize the denominator here, but... Something that to keep in mind is when we move this plus 1, I'm going to just erase that. When we move this plus 1, uh, sorry, minus 1 to the other side, you could have put it after here. But remember, it can't go inside the root bracket, so I always have kids put it in the front so that you don't forget it's there. All right. Well, that's the end of this part of the video, folks. Let's go on to the next video to find the rest of this lesson. See you in the next video.